Sprite Castle. Sprite Castle. Sprite Castle. Put your robo here. Sprite Castle. Hello and welcome to Sprite Castle, the show in which I play, discuss, and review Commodore 64 games. My name is Rob Flack O'Hara, and on this episode of Sprite Castle, I will be discussing Cauldron. Do you happen to know what an Nganga is? Do you know how to spell Nganga? Well, you will by the end of this episode. But before we get started with this episode's game, let's check the Daily Sun for this week's Paperboy Headlines. Welcome back to another episode of Sprite Castle. First and foremost, I want to wish everyone a happy Halloween. Today is October 31st. It is Halloween. And so I hope tonight, uh, if you have young'uns, I hope that you are participating in trick or treating. I hope you are not falling a victim to all the news headlines about kids possibly receiving edibles in their trick or treat baskets, which is, is, you know, essentially the new razor blade in an apple (laughs) story. Uh, You know, the real danger... (laughs) not to take this off the rails right off the bat, which is one of my specialties, but uh, the real danger is uh, getting uh, hit by a car. Kids are three times more likely to get hit by a vehicle on Halloween than any other night of the year. So I hope that you participate in the holiday and I hope that you do so safely and that all your youngins come home in one piece and with lots of candy. And then I hope you, as an adult, get to take your candy tax, which is, uh, I always heard it was a 1% candy tax for parents, but uh, someone told me recently it was 4%. (laughs) I like that even better. So maybe uh, I've been skimming a little bit, not enough off the top, maybe. A few reminders where you can find me. Uh, You can find my videos uh, in two different places on YouTube. One is youtube.com forward slash Sprite Castle. The other is youtube.com forward slash Amigos Retro Gaming on the Amigos uh, Amigos YouTube channel. Just look under the playlist for Sprite Castle. There's Sprite Castle Plays. There's also Sprite Castle Podcast ends up there. So, And while you're there, there's lots of other great videos to check out. If you want to watch me stream live, go to twitch.tv forward slash Rob O'Hara. And don't forget to click the follow button and you will get notified when I am streaming. You never know when something's going to pop up on the old stream, especially maybe later tonight on Halloween. Who knows? Uh, And finally, for all my podcast links and information, you can go to podcast.roboHara.com. There are feeds there, but most people get their feeds through iTunes or other uh, RSS aggregators, and there's a uh, feed for Sprite Castle right on the Amigos page as well. It's uh, anchor.fm. So lots of places to get the podcasts. Uh, feedback for the previous episode. I did want to mention one thing on the previous episode. I talked about the monsters, and one of the things that confused me was on the box. Artwork, it has a picture of all the monsters, and it has the youngest monster's child, Eddie Munster, holding a baseball bat, which confused me. And several of you reminded me that Eddie is carrying a baseball bat in the opening credits of the Monsters TV show, which is obviously where they got the idea from. I would have liked a double uh, joke. I thought they could put maybe possibly a vampire bat on top of the baseball bat, (laughs) some sort of thing. Uh, but, uh, they did not. So it is a direct callback to the TV show. So it's been a while. I've, I've watched episodes of the monsters, but I had not watched the opening credits recently of the monsters. And I had forgot that detail. So thanks to everybody who reminded me about that, uh, uh, little detail that I had missed. And now let's talk about last episodes, Kings of the castle. Last episode was the Monsters, and the 8-bit song that played at the end of the episode was Our House by Madness. And of course, the correlation is that the game begins in the Monsters house. Now, that was a little confusing because I said on the show that the game takes place in a castle, and on the back 
of the box, it does say that Marilyn has been taken away to a castle. But after going rewatching the video, the playback of the entire game, I believe that you do start in the Munster's house and then... There's that middle portion of the game that we saw where Spot the dragon goes with the car and they go to a second location. So I believe the second location is the castle and I believe the first location is supposed to be the monster's house. So uh, despite all the confusion, lots of people figured it out. And that included Justin May, Paul Marfleet, Bill Spear, Mitsuyama, Joe Sharippa, Steve Sharippa, Zorglub, Edward Smith, Aardvark, Roy Jacobs, who sent me some uh, very cute photos of his children dressed up for Halloween, and Pajaco6502 made it in just under the deadline. So congratulations to all the kings of the castle. We had a little party set up in the VIP room with bowls full of Halloween candy. We had some extra left over that we didn't set aside for the trick-or-treaters. And we had the monsters along with their, I don't know if it was the Dragula that they brought. I think it was. Or they had set up and all the VIPs got to take photos with the monsters, although, or with the monsters, I should say. However, uh, it did turn out that they were all celebrity impersonators. It wasn't the real monsters. We're kind of operating on a, a budget here. Uh, but congratulations to everybody who got to hang out in the VIP room. And you can call yourself an official king of the castle if you would like to become a king of the castle all you got to do is listen towards the end of the episode you will hear a 8-bit song played it will not be from the game but it will have some sort of connection with this week's theme all you got to do is send me an email at rob o'hara at rob o'hara.com put king of the castle in the subject line and tell me what that song is, and if there's... Sometimes the connections are pretty loose. I'm I'm pretty forgiving on what the connections are. Sometimes they're on the nose. But anyway, if you'll mention whatever the connection is with the song and the game, then perhaps you will receive a digital key that gives you access to the King of the Castle's VIP room. Uh, I just recorded a few days ago, so I don't have any Commodore news or any questions. So, if you have feedback about this or any episode of the show, you can email me directly at robohara at robohara.com. You can join in on the conversation at Facebook at facebook.com forward slash robcasts. You can follow me on Twitter at Commodore. Come chat with me on the Amigos Retro Gaming Discord or leave a message on the podcast hotline, which is area code 405-486-YDKF. If you'd like to support my shows, you can go over to my Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash Rob O'Hara. All my patrons get access to behind-the-scenes blog posts, weekly videos, access to the Amigos Retro Gaming Discord server, and other additional perks. To find out more, again, visit my Patreon page, that is patreon.com forward slash Rob O'Hara. This episode of Sprite Castle is proudly sponsored by Retro Rewind. For all your Commodore bits, bytes, and accessories, visit Retro Rewind at retrorewind.ca. And don't forget, when you're checking out, use the discount code SC10 for Sprite Castle, and you will get a 10% discount right off of your entire order. I did want to mention that I was recently on Retro Rewind's site, and they are selling a neat PLA. This is a PLA replacement. Uh, it is $17. That is one of the most common chips to fail on the Commodore 64. I'm sure you've all heard the nightmares of people plugging in Sega Genesis controllers into their Commodore 64 and shorting out a chip. That's the PLA. You've all been warned not to switch joysticks while the computer is running, even though every single person who's ever owned a Commodore 64 does that. But on the rare case that there's a spark or a, a shock or something like that, it will blow the PLA. When the PLA goes, you won't have joysticks. You won't have a keyboard. Um, it's, I mean, of the, of the three chips, you know, the SID, the VIC, and the PLA, uh, those are the, the big three. And so back in the day, if the PLA went out, all you could do really was find a, a donor Commodore 64 and pull the chip out of that one. You know, that's why I had so many spare 
old dead computers is that I would, you know, go through and harvest chips when things blow up. But you don't have to do that anymore because Retro Rewind has a spare neat PLA chips. It is a drop-in replacement. Now, you do have to have the right version of the motherboard. You have to have a long board. But if you, first of all, if you're replacing chips on your Commodore 64, you probably already know what type of motherboard you have. But if you don't know what type of motherboard you have, go on Twitter and hit up Retro Rewind. That's that's the name of their account, and they can help you. And they will also, if you want, uh, send you a link to their Discord server. And you could go on there and ask all kinds of technical questions and get help. There's a lot of people hanging out there. So a uh, real friendly bunch of guys, uh, great products, and don't know what else to say about it. So Retro N, hey, if you need one, use my code. You get 10% off, so you can't beat that. And this has been this week's news headlines brought to you by my local paper boy who just crashed into my Ghostbusters Halloween display. I've been flying. Now that we've covered this week's news, let's discuss this week's snack. Crack, crack, crack the egg into the bowl. Crack, crack, crack the egg into the bowl. Talking snack. You know, fall is upon us. Halloween is tonight. And this is the time where we break out all those fall foods that we associate with fall and Halloween. And, oh, I think of cupcakes that may have uh, spider rings in them or spider webs drawn on them and icing or maybe even a ghost on a donut and things like that. Uh, but one thing that is every fall... <laughs> and is unavoidable, is pumpkin-flavored drinks. Uh, I know Starbucks with their uh, pumpkin spice latte has been popular over uh, you know the past several years. Lots of people like pumpkin drinks and pumpkin coffee, pumpkin latte. And for me, like I, I'm more of a pumpkin pie guy, to be honest with you, <laughs> than pumpkin... Uh, uh, drinks and especially sweet pumpkin drinks. I just don't really love them. You know, uh, I was at a, a pub last week and I had a Oktoberfest beer that was pumpkin flavored and it wasn't my favorite. Although I did get to bring home a big uh, Oktoberfest mug. So I, apparently that was, uh, I mean, it was worth it. But while I was in the store the other day, I ran across a box of Keurig K-Cups that are made by Dunkin' Donuts, which I guess now is just known as Dunkin'. They've changed their name. Uh, so they are officially Dunkin', not Dunkin' Donuts. And apparently that's because they sell two things now, dunk, uh, donuts uh, and coffee. <laughs> and they were selling uh, those K-Cups, the little coffee plastic cups, pumpkin spice flavored coffee. Now, I got to tell you, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of the K-Cup thing. I mean, I, they are convenient, and I do uh, make K-Cup coffee sometime with our Keurig. But we have a uh, like a dual coffee maker. So one side makes full pots of coffee, and the other side just makes single mugs of coffee with the K-Cup, which is way more expensive. It's not necessarily great for the environment all those little plastic cups although some of them are recyclable and these aren't recyclable these duncan ones but they were on sale because it's so close to halloween and so i picked up a box of uh, uh the picture i have here says 10 but i think we got an entire like a 24 pack and they're not bad the pumpkin is not overwhelming it is a you know coffee flavor first but there is that little hint of of pumpkin and they're not terrible uh i've read online there's a even on the box you can see they have uh they have a slice of pumpkin pie so you you know they're trying to show you what it might taste like but they have this little dollop of whipped cream on top of the pie and i thought maybe this coffee would be better with a little bit of whipped cream on top and we did not have whipped cream but we did have bourbon and <laughs> bourbon makes it taste great <laughs> so uh to get into the mood it's it's halloween and i did make myself a mug of duncan pumpkin spice i want to say duncan pumpkin because that rhymes but it's duncan pumpkin spice coffee 
The one I have here right now does not have any bourbon in it, but the one I had last night did. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you are into pumpkin flavored things, then I, I, they do sell this, you know, at their store. But if you want to make it at home, this is a good way to get it. And speaking of pumpkins, Cauldron which features pumpkins, was published for the Commodore 64 in 1985 by Broderbun Software. It is a game for one player that uses joystick controls. It was published by Broderbun, and we've covered Broderbun games several times on Sprite Castle, including Load Runner, Karatika, and the Castles of Dr. Creep. So I won't go into the history of... Broderbun, if you want to hear about the history, I would go back and visit Load Runner. I think that's the first episode uh, that I covered a Broderbun game on and went deep into the company's history. The developer of this game is Palace Software. Normally, I remember developers' names, and this did not sound familiar to me. I looked them up. They operated from 1984 to 1991, at which point they were sold to Titus Software who operated them for one more year and then closed them down in 1992. Games developed by Palace Software include Rad Warrior. Some people know that as, I've always pronounced as anti-Riad, anti-Raid, however you say that, I always say anti-Riad. Uh, but Rad Warrior, Death Sword, a.k.a. Barbarian, you might recognize as a Palace Software release. Metal Mutant is one of their latest releases. Acts of Rage is one of their games. And then, of course, Cauldron 1 and Cauldron 2. One of Palace Software's early titles was Evil Dead, which was based on the movie Evil Dead. And they decided to make a movie based on the movie or make a game based on the movie Halloween as well. But uh, being in the UK and due to ratings board controversy, they dropped the Halloween title, and they canceled it. But the code and the basics of the game was turned into Cauldron. Cauldron, you play as an old witch who is trying to retrieve a magical broom which is being guarded by the Pump King deep in the caves of the pumpkins. The goal of the game is to make a magic potion which will ultimately defeat the Pump King. And this is done by attaining the potion's six ingredients which are hidden deep in six different caves. Uh, again, this game began life as a Halloween game, and then when that title was dropped, it was morphed into what we now know as Cauldron. The box of the game has this wonderful artwork. I really, really love it. I can't tell if this is uh, what medium this is, if this is airbrushed. It almost looks like it's uh, chalk or something like that, and it has this great three-dimensional picture of the old witch and she is stirring the giant brew making her potion in the cauldron across the top you get the title cauldron uh and then it just says commodore 64 so it's very uh, subtle it's very plain but very effective uh, it makes you want to find out what exactly is going on inside this game on the back of the cartridge uh, it just has a, a short little explanation that says, Experience the breathtaking excitement of Cauldron, an arcade adventure game that sets a new standard in graphic realism. Well, I don't know about all that. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you saw it, you went, Oh, that's a cute game. I don't know that you would say, Oh, this is a new standard in graphic realism. 
Uh, but uh, but there you go. <laughs> That's listed on the back of a cartridge. And inside on the instructions, and I'm going to try to make this as big as possible so I can read it, uh, is this parchment, which has been... Now, the picture that I'm showing on the website, this is on the inside of the cassette copy, so it's much smaller. But on the box, you actually got this sheet of a, a parchment. And it says, Hearken witches everywhere. Take the challenge if you dare. Tomorrow night is Halloween when only... Oh, it's folded here. When only something shall be witch's queen. Uh, but as it goes on, it explains the game. This is your instructions. It says six ingredients they must take and in the cauldron, boil and bake. And then it goes on and it lists the different ingredients. And, and then it tells you basically that you have to put these ingredients together. You have to make a spell. And then that is the way that you will defeat the pump king. Uh, and get the magical broom. So that's a very fun way to explain what the goal of the game is without just, you know, making it uh, uh, just a doldrum list of things that you need to do. So it's really tied into the game's theme, and it's uh, really well done. I really enjoy that part. Let's switch over to the game's video so that you can see what it looks like. Uh, as the game loads, there is a... Uh, a menu screen that pops up. It has credits. It has uh, uh, things like that. The first thing that you see is the cauldron logo. And we get the witch uh, who you will be playing in the game who flies to the logo and walks around on top of the logo and then eventually flies off and flies all around it. Uh, we get credits. It says the pulsating programming was done by Richard Leinfellner. The dynamic designing was done by Steve Brown and amiable assisting by Stanley Shembry. Uh, then it says copyright palace software, 1985. The 1985 is in Roman numerals, which kind of, I like it that it ties into this theme. It just kind of gives this old school type of theme to the game. Uh, once you go past this, you get another menu screen. And again, this ties back to the way uh, it all ties into the theme of this game. It's a very solid theme that runs throughout the entire thing. And this ties back almost to the uh, parchment. It says, before thou canst concoct thy brew, thy joystick should be in port two, <laughs> which I really enjoy. Then it says, so play the game and face the test and fire and fly upon thy quest. Basically, this is telling you to press the fire button to begin. And once you begin, you will see uh, the game screen. Now, on the upper left-hand side, there is your score being displayed, and it says magic, and there's a percentage that's being displayed there, and that is uh, constantly, I mean, that magic is basically your health, your hit points. Um, and then on the right, uh, it says hags, which is witches, and it shows how many lives you have left. Now, this game, you start with nine lives, which sounds like a lot. Uh, and if that sounds like a lot to you, you haven't played Cauldron. <laughs> now, uh, one of the things you'll be doing, and I'm jumping ahead here, but you'll be obtaining keys. And you need the keys to get access to the locked doors that block the caves. As you obtain keys, those are displayed in the middle. There's a big open spot in the middle. Now, the top left and the top right, I mean, this is like one-fifth of each side, uh, is a parchment scroll that never displays anything. I don't know if that was intended at some point to display something or if it's just taking up space, um, but there's a very important thing that we'll talk about later that really should have been displayed somewhere on the menu that's not. And it makes me think that that's what those spots were intended for. And perhaps before uh, uh, it went to production, either they couldn't get it to work or I don't really know. But it, it takes up a lot of menu space for no reason. I mean, at the bare minimum, I would put the name of the game up there or something like that or put, you know, I don't know, a picture of the witch, maybe a close up of, the, of her face. I don't know. Uh, but it's definitely dead real estate right across the top of the game. Now, as the game begins, you are, I guess I would say, above ground. You know, you're flying over the earth. You, you are a witch 
and you have a broom and you can fly around and you have to shoot enemies. Uh, those include bats. You'll see pumpkins. You'll see ghosts. You'll see seagulls. You'll see sharks. You will see killer plants. You'll see volcano fire fireballs that shoot up at you. There's no shortage of things trying to kill you. Um, you will also uh, eventually start to find keys as you fly back and forth and as you're shooting all these things. This is way harder than it sounds, but you will see keys down on the ground. They're usually hidden behind uh, foliage, these little bushes and things or among the trees. They're not easy to find. They don't just stand out. So you'll be flying around for a while shooting all these things while you're looking for these keys. Now, after you obtain a key, and by the way, the keys are in different colors, so they're color-coded, down on the bottom of the ground, you will see these caves. And these caves have locked doors that are color-coded to match the keys. So if you find the right color key and the right color door, you land on your broom and you can enter the cave. Now, once you do that, uh, the game changes from what it was. I mean, it starts out basically as a flying, uh, side-scrolling shoot 'em up You're flying around shooting things. Um, and then once you go into a cave, it turns into a platform game. So the controls are completely different. Uh, in the, the caves, you'll see some of the same things. You'll see the ghosts and the bats and the the fireballs, but you'll see um, skulls, which are new. You'll see rib cages, just rib cages by themselves. That's an odd thing. That's an odd enemy to just have a rib cage. Uh, various bones. Again, the plants are down there. There's there's no shortage of things anywhere in this game uh, of enemies trying to kill you. Uh, inside each cave, if you go far enough in the platform, so it could be five screens on the platform. It could be 10 screens. Uh, you know, I, maybe 10 screens might be about the biggest cave, maybe 10 or 15 screens. I don't know. Uh, at the end of those, you will find one of the six potion ingredients, at which point after you have that, you need to exit the cave, which in most of the caves means going all the way back out the way you came uh, and then going back above ground and going to the other part of the game where you're now flying around again, uh, collecting more keys that will let you into other caves so that you can obtain uh, more ingredients to make the potion that will eventually kill the pump king. So again, in these two parts of the game, the controls are completely different. When you are flying, you can shoot out of the front of your broom. If you're pressing up or down, you can shoot diagonal up or diagonal down. And the four directions on the joystick control the four directions uh, that you are flying. And when you go down into the cave and it becomes a platform game, the joystick acts more like a, a platform game. You can move left and right and the button jumps. Uh, you can no longer shoot and up and down. Don't do anything on the joystick at that point. Now, because this is really like two halves of different games, there are two completely different strategies. The game, I mean, it is really two different games uh, or gameplay styles that are linked together in the same game. Uh, when you are above ground, the enemies constantly just fly towards you. Uh, they track you down and will run into you when they hit you. They take away your magic, so you have to constantly be shooting things. You can't sit still. If you sit still, everything will just fly towards you, hit you, and you will die very quickly. Uh, so you have to be mobile. You have to be flying around, and you have to be quick. You can't fly slowly and try to figure out where you're going. You just have to pretty much be moving quickly all the time. Uh, one of the things as you begin to play this game is you need to figure out what the keys look like and where they're hidden. So that will make them easier to find as you play in the future. There are also these little sparkly things. I don't know technically what they're called, but when you stand on them, uh, they recharge your magic, your, your life. So that basically they boost your health back up. You'll have to have those because your health in this game, and uh, I'll talk about this in just a second, but the health in this game acts almost like gauntlet. Uh, it is it is constantly going down. So if you're not constantly healing yourself, you will die very quickly. 
Um, the keys are always located in the same spots, but the colors are randomized. So it's not like you can always go to, you know, one area and get the red key always. There will be a key there, but it might not be the red key. It could be the purple or the green key. And the, I, I, I don't know if the door colors are randomized or not, but it doesn't matter. The point of it is, is that you can't memorize this game. You can memorize where the keys are, but it's you're still it's not going to be linear and you're not going to the first key is not always going to unlock the same uh the first location. Um let's see what else. Uh when you're underneath playing the platform game, the monsters act differently. They they're more like a platform a game like we think of where the monsters move on a specific path. It may be left and right or up and down, or they may have a, a path that they follow across the screen and they keep doing. Uh, so it's more about learning the monster's paths. There's a lot of, I mean, it's all about jumping. The whole platform thing is all about jumping. And I don't want to say pixel perfect jumping, but you have to be right on the edge of a lot of the platforms to land on the next platform. So it's very easy to, uh, misjudge a jump and fall either to your death or to uh, a screen below. There's can be a lot of backtracking in the platform version. Sometimes I noticed I missed a jump and it dropped me to a lower platform. And the only way to get up the platform was to go back four or five screens and then go up to the higher level and go back up and try that jump again. So lots of backtracking if you miss a jump. Uh, let's see what else. There's lots of moving platforms. That's another thing on my list, uh, down in the bottom, the portion, the underground, the cave version and the moving platforms always have you going through the path of some creature. So you'll be jumping and landing on the same platform. It reminds me a lot of that level of uh, super Mario brothers three, where you're on the platforms and it's going along a predetermined route and there are monsters in the way and you have to jump over the monsters, but land back on the moving platform. So uh, get ready to die a lot doing that. <laughs> I did that. And then there's also, and frustratingly so the underground portion of the game doesn't scroll the top, the above ground when you're flying around scrolls left and right as you're flying around on the broomstick. But the bottom portion of the game doesn't scroll. It's just screens and it changes to the next screen. And almost every screen has you jumping blindly into the next screen, hoping that you land on a platform. There's lots of times where you're near the top of the screen and you're jumping over things. And as you do, it will flip to the screen above you just for a moment to show your head bouncing. And then it goes back down to the bottom. So uh, I don't like blind jumping in platform games. I don't like jumping onto the next screen and not knowing if there's something there, if I should have jumped uh, long or, you know, a small jump or whatever. So that part of it was uh, very frustrating. Now at the top of the description or the top of the show, I mentioned that you get nine lives in this game. Uh, first of all, your health goes down 1%. Your magic goes down 1% every four seconds or so. So almost like Gauntlet where you, I mean, if you just stand still, your magic levels will go down. So that's no good. You've got to find these little things to heal your magic or boost your magic, or just by walking around, you will die. Um, every time you shoot your broom when you're flying around takes 1% of your health away. Now think about a shooter where, Every time you shoot, it's taking a little bit. I mean, that's hard. So again, when you're, especially when you're above ground, you've got to be looking for those little healing, um, little flashing things and get on top of those because you're going to run out of health very quickly. Uh, and then finally, when you kind of like gauntlet, when you run into the, uh, the enemies, they don't kill you. They just take away a percentage of your health. Some of the smaller enemies are like 10%. Some of the bigger enemies later are 50%. So it just, you know, depends on, and I think there are, I could be wrong, but there were some parts in the platform part of the game where I couldn't figure out a way to progress without running into a creature. Maybe there was a way to do it, but I couldn't figure it out. So uh, that's just part of the strategy was bumping into some of those creatures to kill them 
and then immediately trying to find one of those uh, magic rejuvenators, which in some of the platform areas, there may only be one below. There may be two. There may be none. It just matters. I mean, it just, they're, they're all different. So, uh, yeah, nine lives, you can go through them in a hurry. That's what I'm saying. Once you have collected, you have to, first of all, you have to get this little bowl. Um, you have to find the bowl because you can't carry all the ingredients without having the little bowl. It's like a vial, I guess. Uh, and then you get all six ingredients. And once you get all that, you've got to go back to your, your little witch house and turn that into the potion that will eventually kill the pump king. He is the final boss of the game. Now, as far as final bosses go, this one's real simple. If you walk in and you have the potion, he dies and you get the broom and the game's over. I mean, that's it. If you walk into his house and you don't have the potion, he kills you. He takes one of your lives. That's it. <laughs> so it's a very simple way to figure out whether you're going to beat the, the final boss or not. If you have the potion, you win. If you don't have the potion, you lose. Now, here's a little bit of a trivia fact for you. I used to be friends a long time ago with a guy who was in multiple bands. And his bands had the greatest names. And one of his bands was a death metal band named Nganga. <laughs> which is spelled, if you're curious, N-G-A-N-G-A. -A -A, Nganga. Uh, it is a word that they believe came from the Congo and it meant herbalist or herbalist or a spiritual healer. And that word has been adapted by many different cultures, including Haiti and Brazil and Cuba all uh, use the word in Ganga. Uh, it is an interesting word because it has the same uh, and the root word of in Ganga is Ganga, G-A-N-G-A. Um, which means medicine. You may recognize that for ganja <laughs> as well. So in Ganga and ganja have the same uh, root word. Uh, but in Cuba, it also refers to this creation that they used to make in these large cauldrons and they would pour in people's bones and sticks and all kinds of things. And they would, you know, basically boil this thing into a big stew and this was uh, part of a ritual that would release uh, people's spirits. And the spirits were also referred to as Nganga. So that was what was being released from the cauldron. So both the cauldron and the spirits being released were referred to as Nganga. Uh, in the late 80s, and this is where my friend heard the word, was in uh, there was a the satanic killings that were happening in Matamoros, Mexico. And it was a big news story in the late eighties. And what the story was were there were these drug smugglers who thought that if they made sacrifices to the devil, that they wouldn't get caught by police. And so they were making human sacrifices uh, for that reason. And the human sacrifices turned out to be college kids from Texas <laughs> Um, who were going across the border into these, uh, I don't remember if it was Texas, but it was a border town, but they were going over to Matamoros, Mexico and going to bars and clubs. And a couple of kids got abducted and murdered and boiled <laughs> inside these giant cauldrons, which the news referred to as an Nganga. So there you go. There's a little bit of trivia for you. And uh, that is a great word if you can ever use that one in Scrabble. N-G-A, N-G-A. That's enough about uh, Creepy Cauldrons. Let's talk about the reviews of this game. Commodore User and Home Computing Weekly gave this game 10 out of 10. Commodore and Video Games Magazine, Commodore Horizons Magazine gave it 9 out of 10. Zap, the Commodore Format, Your 64, and Your Commodore Magazines all gave it 8 out of 10. Uh, Lemon64 currently has it at a 7 out of 10, and C64 Games is 6 out of 10. What you'll typically find, or what I found, 
in the reviews of this game is when the game came out, it got very high reviews. I mean, 10 out of 10 is pretty good review. 9 out of 10, pretty good. And when modern reviews give it a lower score, and I think that is because some of the parts of this game haven't necessarily aged well. The platform part of this game is very... Well, not just that. All parts of this game. Let's just put it out there. All parts of this game are difficult. Uh, The platform part is very hard to do. The above ground where things are flying at you and you're flying around. And if you don't know where the keys are, uh, also very difficult to pull off. So I think um, at the time, it's a good looking game. Uh, All the sprites are well animated. You've got these bats flying around, these rib cages spinning. You have the witch who has her little funny walk as she walks around with her broom and then, of course, flies around as well, cackling. Uh, So, you know, the graphics look really good and were probably very impressive for 1985. However, the difficulty is what I don't think aged uh, very well. This game was released for three systems along with the Commodore 64. It was also released on the Amstrad CPC and for the ZX Spectrum. Uh, There was a sequel, as I referred to earlier in the show, Cauldron 2, which was released for those same three systems. And then in 1990, it was re-released in a package that had both games. So uh, in that package, you got Cauldron on the front side of the disc and Cauldron 2 on the back side of the same floppy disc. A few years later, a sequel called Super Cauldron was released, and that was more of a 16-bit title, I suppose. It was released on the Amiga, the Amstrad CPC, the Atari ST, and DOS. It is a different game. Uh, it looks better than the 8-bit version, obviously, and it's a continuation of the story. So it's a, it's different gameplay than Cauldron 1 and Cauldron 2. In Cauldron 2, you actually play uh, the pumpkin. You play the other side of the game, and you have a different quest. Uh, so Super Cauldron is uh, even different from that. If you would like to own Cauldron... Uh, I found on eBay a loose copy, just the floppy disk by itself, is available for $14. And then there is the later Brotobun release with Cauldron 1 and 2 on the same floppy. Again, this is just loose, uh, disk only, going for $20. I also found the cassette tape uh, available for $20. So I didn't find any new in the box uh, versions of the floppy disk one. But if you just want the loose disk, Looks like $20 will we'll get you this. And now let's talk a little bit my memories, about my memories, I should say, <laughs> of the game Cauldron. All right, time travelers. Seat belt fastened. Yes. Get it away to the past. Huh? <laughs> So Cauldron is one of those games that I had and did not understand. So I didn't play it. Uh, I didn't know how the game's mechanics worked. I didn't understand. uh, I don't know that I ever found the keys because the keys are kind of hidden. And I didn't know what you're supposed to do, which is ultimately find the keys and unlock the cave doors so that you can make the potion. I sound... Like a broken record, I'm afraid, because there were so many of these games that I had copies of as a kid uh, that I downloaded from BBSs and I would play. But this is one that without the instructions and knowing what you're supposed to do, it's really it's just unplayable. Uh, Without the instructions, it's kind of more just like an interactive demo. You fly around with the witch and you shoot the different things, but. I mean, at the end of the day, you're, I don't think you're ever going to figure out how to play it without some sort of instructions or somebody telling you that. So it's unfortunate that I had this game all the way back in the early 80s and never really played it. Now, I would say I rediscovered Cauldron and Cauldron 2 back when I got kind of back into the Commodore 64, which would have been the early uh, 2000s, I would say. And the great thing about that era when I started revisiting these old games was you could also find the instructions on the internet. And so once I read the instructions, 
then I understood more about how to play the game and and uh, actually go around trying to beat it. I don't think before the internet, I'm trying to think here, but before the internet, I don't think paying or playing holiday themed games was necessarily a big deal. Uh, I do remember watching the Commodore 64 Christmas demo a couple of times on Christmas, and I do remember checking out the 4th of July uh, uh, Activision's fireworks construction set on the 4th of July, but it just doesn't seem like it was a big deal. Like, I didn't all, you know, wait until Halloween to play Halloween-themed games or wait until Christmas to play Christmas-themed games if there were any Christmas-themed games. So... That wasn't as big of a deal as it is now on the internet. On the internet, people uh, watch horror movies around Halloween and they play horror games around Halloween and they play winter and Christmas games around Christmas. And I just don't remember that being uh, that big of a, a thing. I mean, because it wasn't that big of a community back then. Uh, not not the way that it is today. So I I certainly don't remember playing this game on Halloween or associating it with Halloween until the internet came out. And of course now, uh, you know, with today being Halloween, uh, this is one of the things that we do is we revisit uh, games that tie into a theme. And this certainly ties into Halloween. So I'm glad that uh, I revisited it for sure. And it does scratch that itch. If you're looking for a Halloween themed game to play, this is a good one. For graphics, I give this game four out of five Pump Kings. Everything looks great. There's lots of great little animations and you can easily tell what everything is supposed to be. For music, I give it three out of five Pump Kings. There's an opening theme, which is great, but unfortunately, that's the only music that we get. For sound effects, I give it four out of five Pump Kings. Uh, lots of great little sound effects going on that tell you what's happening in the game. For overall gameplay, I could only give it three out of five Pump Kings. Uh, to fully enjoy Cauldron, you'll need to put some time into understanding the game's mechanics and read up to understand what you're supposed to be doing. And even then, what you'll find is one of the more challenging action games available on the Commodore 64. Unfortunately, I'm afraid Cauldron just may be too hard for most casual gamers and may only appeal to those masochists out there. Thanks again for tuning in to Sprite Castle. If you have feedback about this or any episode of the show, you can email me directly at Rob O'Hara, robohara.com. Join the conversation on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Robcast. Follow me on Twitter at Commodore. Come chat with me on the Amigas Retro Gaming Discord or leave me a message on my podcast hotline, which is 405-486-YDKF. All patrons of my show get behind-the-scenes boasts, weekly videos, access to the Amigos Retro Gaming Discord server, and other additional perks. To find out more, visit patreon.com forward slash Rob O'Hara. And extra special thanks to all my patrons. These are the people that keep this show moving forward each week. My 8-bit supporters are Alan Hennessy, Alan Hudgens, Armadon Restel, Brian Barr, Kerry Clanton, Chris Albright, Chris Folds, C Doves, Cowbird Boy, Dan Paradroid Heavey, Dave Velociraptor, David Hearn, David Modelak, Eric Stryanisi, Garrett Al Ye, Gary Heather, Graham Vebke, Jake Nonamaker, Jason Warns, John Bodakar Schaller, John Pearson, John Treholt, Jose Quezada, Joshua Eckroth, Mark Alley, Mike McLaughlin, Mitsuyama, Mr. Bundy, Mr. Wacky, Nathan Dagenhart, Olaf Hope, Patrick Markey, Rad Max, Ride On, Christopher Bow, Retro Trace, Rick Reynolds, Robot Doctor 82, Roy Jacobs, Scooter Prime, Scott Lambert, Scott Meredith, Scrap Arcade, Stephen Burt, Steve Rasmussen, The Slow Norris, Brand New Supporter, Travis Gossie, Welcome to the Party, Travis, Zeke Pabsky, Zerfall, 
and the mysterious Cobra Kai. An extra special thanks to my 16-bit supporters, Bill Spear, Boarshead Tavern BBS, Dan Creek, Dave Zilly, Edward Smith, John Morrison, Matt Nicholson, Matt Smith, John Van Drasick, Steve Sharippa, and Vintage Volts. Thank you guys so much for your support. I really, really appreciate it. This episode of Sprite Castle is sponsored by Retro Rewind. For all your Commodore 64 bits, bytes, and accessories, go over to RetroRewind.ca and don't forget when checking out, use SC10 as your discount code for a 10% discount off of your total order. Sprite Castle is available from iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts, the RSS feed at podcast.robohara.com, and through the official Amigos podcast feed at anchor.fm forward slash Amigos podcast. To hear more podcasts from me like You Don't Know Flat, Cactus Flax, Throwback Reviews, and Multiple Sadness, visit podcast.robohara.com. Many of the news articles and game details for Sprite Castle come from websites such as Commodore News, Indie Retro News, Vintage is the New Old, the Commodore Scene Database, Lemon64, and Moby Games. Thanks again for listening. Now get back to flying that brew, and we'll see you here next time on Sprite Castle. I just blew the name of my podcast right at the end. <laughs> oh dear. Happy Halloween, everybody. <laughs>